On December 24, 1979, the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan in order to prop up the faltering communist government they had helped install. Smelling an opportunity to make its ideological enemy bleed, the United States covertly began a process of funding and arming a resistance to the Soviet invasion. The clandestine operation would prove crucial in defeating the Soviet Union's efforts in Afghanistan. And as the Red Army pulled out of the nation in defeat in 1989, Americans cheered their great success. They had no idea that their victory had planted the seeds of America's own defeat just 30 years later. To understand what went wrong in Afghanistan, first one has to understand recent Afghan history. In 1953, Afghanistan's king, Muhammad Zahir Shah, wished to modernize his country. Zahir Shah recognized that he lacked the expertise to lead a major modernization effort and that his country needed an expanded government. To that end, he relinquished some of his own power and made his cousin, General Muhammad Daoud Khan, prime minister. With the focus of expanding government with the recruitment of economic and policy experts, further relinquishing his own absolute power. The move was a popular one with the Afghan people, who saw it as a selfless act. Next, though, the nation would need international aid. So the new Afghan government reached out to both Cold War rivals, the Soviet Union and the United States. Zahir Shah, however, did not wish to be a client state to either nation, and feared what had happened to the Eastern Bloc nations as they were one by one swallowed up by the Soviet Union. Therefore, he sought a careful balance of aid from both the Americans and Soviets, allowing neither absolute influence. The Americans provided great economic aid and expertise, but in what would prove to be a disastrous move, Zahir Shah allowed Daoud Khan to seek Soviet aid in the training of Afghanistan's military. This meant that every year hundreds of senior Afghan officers left for the Soviet Union to undergo months of training and inevitable indoctrination into Stalin's version of communism. The effect wasn't immediate, but gradual over time. These senior officers began spreading their communist ideals throughout the military ranks, resulting in a military that had a dramatically different vision for Afghanistan than Zahir Shah, who wished neither Soviet-style socialism or cutthroat American capitalism. Zahir Shah eventually forced Daoud Khan to resign his post as prime minister as pro-communist ideals began to interfere with the king's own progressive agenda for the nation. By 1973, Zahir Shah was more popular than ever with the Afghan people, given his great leaps forward in modernization and liberalization of Afghan society, including the equality of women. However, Khan had long been building support amongst these military elite, and all indoctrinated into communism thanks to the Soviet Union. In 1973, as Zahir Shah was abroad on a trip to Italy, Daoud Khan staged a coup, forcing the king into exile. At first, the coup was widely supported as Khan continued the king's liberalization of women and other segments of Afghan society. However, behind the scenes, Khan was purging potential opponents from positions of power, ensuring his own autocratic rule. This caused major schisms within the communists and the creation of multiple opposing communist groups. Inevitably, Khan is killed in a communist coup in 1978, leading to Nur Mohammad Taraki being named president and Babrak Karmal as prime minister. Growing rivalries between opposing communist groups, however, severely weakened Karmal's ability to govern the countryside, and sensing an opportunity, Islamic fundamentalists, long unhappy with liberal policies changing Afghan culture, began their own uprising. The Mujahideen are born. The struggle for power sparked bitter infighting between Taraki and Amin, splitting the Afghan government at the highest level and further weakening its ability to fight the growing insurgency. Just a year after taking power, Amin supporters murdered Taraki as Amin implemented more and more brutal measures. The Amin-led communist government was now a stain on the Soviet Union who believed that if Amin was left in power, he would create a bad name for communism on the world stage. The Soviets thus opt to remove Amin from power and invade the nation in force on December 24, 1979. They prop up Babrak Karmal as prime minister but only succeed in painting the national government as a puppet state controlled by the hostile Soviet invaders. Exactly what Zahir Shah and the Afghan people had worked so hard to avoid. The result is inevitable and a massive insurgency begins. This is where America begins to lay the groundwork for its own defeat. Stinging from its loss in Vietnam, largely due to its own ineptitude but helped along by Soviet support, America was looking for payback. The invasions of Afghanistan was the perfect theater for extracting that payback. And not long after the Red Army first crossed the border into Afghanistan, a major movement to supply the Afghani insurgency began. 
In order to facilitate the arming and financing of the Mujahideen, however, the US needed a way into the nation. With hostile Iran on one side, America was forced to work with Pakistan. Yet, the Pakistani government was ill-equipped to handle the clandestine nature of the work that needed to be done. Only one agency was well-suited to the effort, the Inter-Services Intelligence Agency, or ISI. Up to this point, the ISI had been a small organization struggling for legitimacy, but the influx of American support was exactly the booster shot it needed. This would come back to haunt the US. Facilitating the transfer of millions of dollars of equipment and funds to the Mujahideen, the ISI quickly grew in power and influence in the Pakistani government, eventually rivaling that of the military itself. Unknowingly, the US had just created its own worst enemy, as 30 years later the ISI would actively double-cross the United States in its efforts against the Taliban. Even worse, the US government didn't bother to vet who was receiving aid, allowing the ISI to directly control who would rise to power in Afghanistan largely religious fundamentalists indoctrinated into extremist views by Saudi Arabian clerics, the future Taliban. Not long after the start of the war in 2001, it became clear that the ISI had its own agenda concerning the Taliban. For Pakistan, the Taliban could provide a strong buffer between itself and rival Iran, and under its autocratic rule some semblance of border security with its shared Afghan border could be achieved. If America defeated the Taliban, this would completely undermine its own national security strategy, as well as potentially give the US staging grounds for interference in Pakistan itself. It was no secret that the United States had stationed quick reaction forces in Afghanistan not just to respond to Taliban aggression, but to cross the border into Pakistan to secure Pakistani nuclear weapons in case of a national emergency. With rampant corruption in Pakistan, including the discovery of several senior officials tasked with securing Pakistan's nuclear weapons having ties to terror networks, there was an ever-present threat of Pakistan being stripped of its nuclear arms by the US. In order to ensure that the Taliban was not defeated, the ISI facilitated the covert funding, training, and medical treatment of wounded Taliban fighters, even going so far as to invite them into its northern border areas to use as sanctuary. The agency also worked to spin American drone attacks on Taliban and other terror targets in Pakistan's northern regions in order to put international pressure on the US to cease such attacks. For example, the Pakistani government forbade the US from verifying casualty reports from drone attacks and instead relied on the personal testimony of victims of said attack. This allowed the ISI and Taliban to spin casualty figures in a way that favored them greatly exaggerating civilian casualty counts while diminishing the presence of legitimate military targets who often use civilians as willing human shields anyway. But the ISI would go even further. When American troops put pressure on Taliban forces, the ISI allowed them to cross the border into Pakistan where US soldiers could not follow. When senior Taliban and other insurgent or terrorist officials were targeted for destruction or arrest, the ISI leaked America's plans in order to ensure their survival. Lastly, while it was never proven, it's almost certain that the ISI had helped Osama bin Laden evade American efforts to capture him, even going so far as to permit him residency in the heart of one of Pakistan's military enclaves, a place that they never believed the US would risk a raid into. While 1980s America could not have known that the ISI would turn out to be one of its worst enemies, it also made no effort to police where hundreds of millions in weapons and funds were actually being channeled, leaving the effort almost entirely to Pakistanis. This directly led to the bulk of these weapons and money going straight into the hands of groups with extremist ideologies, including displaced Afghans who had been indoctrinated by Saudi clerics into fundamentalism. Rather than carefully vet who could eventually be left in power after a Soviet withdrawal, America simply turned on the money hose and let the chips fall where the ISI wanted them to, possibly one of the worst policy mistakes ever made by the United States. Had the US been directly involved in the dissemination of funds and equipment, it could have empowered groups favorable to US interests in Afghanistan, avoiding the 2001 invasion altogether. With the invasion well into its planning phases, however, modern America continued to blunder in critical ways. First, the United States was warned by the Northern Alliance seeking to overthrow the Taliban that it should wait on using military force. By 2001, the Taliban was pulling itself apart at the seams as internal struggles for power and public dissatisfaction led to major infighting. It was believed by Afghan insiders that given a few years and international political and economic pressure, the Taliban would simply implode. 
However, President Bush and his administration was not interested in a political long-term strategy to defeat the Taliban. America had been attacked by Al-Qaeda, which the Taliban directly supported and allowed to operate in Afghanistan, and the US rightly wanted blood. Military action was inevitable, but even here the US could have acted without sowing the seeds of its own inevitable defeat. Rather than an invasion of Afghanistan, America should have carried out punitive attacks against Al-Qaeda using its long-range striking power. While these would not have been enough to erode Al-Qaeda's power completely, it could have had a significant effect on the terror group. Even more importantly, it would send a clear message to the Taliban, continue supporting our enemies and you will be next. In 2001, there was already major friction between the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, who had begun to operate across parts of Afghanistan as if they were in control. This was a continued source of friction between the Taliban factions, and a campaign of shock and awe against the Al-Qaeda targets could have capitalized on that friction, spurring the Taliban to end its support for the terror group, which was supposed to be the entire point of the 2001 invasion in the first place. If the Taliban had refused, then punitive actions could be taken, once more using long-range striking power against the Taliban itself, pummeling it into submission. The mistake was trying to remove the Taliban from power altogether. By attacking it, America only succeeded in causing the Taliban to join ranks in common purpose, eliminating the chance of its inevitable collapse due to infighting. Military power, however, might not have been necessary at all, and another option would have been to use economic power. Remember, the goal was to eliminate Al-Qaeda's ability to launch attacks against the US. A much simpler way to achieve this would have been simply pay off the Taliban. The Taliban itself was not inherently ideologically opposed to the US the way Al-Qaeda was and by that time had already been receiving tens of millions of dollars from the US to curtail the cultivation of poppies for heroin. The US could have simply turned that cash hose on and bribed the Taliban to turn against Al-Qaeda entirely. Cash has always spoken louder with the Taliban than ideology, and there were numerous factions that would have gladly accepted American money in order to strengthen themselves. By making the Taliban and the severely economically challenged Afghanistan reliant on US aid, it would have been even more compliant to US interests as time and money went on. The best way to fight a battle, after all, is to have someone else fight it for you. The influx of cash would have staved off an inevitable collapse of the Taliban, as the Northern Alliance had warned would happen if the US had simply waited. But the US should never have invested itself in regime change in the first place. It should have set off to achieve its one singular goal of defeating Al Qaeda. Instead, it allowed itself to get sucked into a quagmire of conflicting goals and strategies that quickly had nothing to do with the defeat of the terror group that attacked America on September 11th. Once the invasion was underway, however, even more blunders were to come. First, the US became entirely too reliant on Pakistan in its efforts to plug up the Pakistani-Afghan border. As American troops fought and defeated the Taliban, the enemy would simply slip past the border into safe areas that the US troops couldn't follow. With the ISI's treachery well known by American military commanders early in the war, the United States should have done more to put pressure on Pakistan to correct its bad actor attitude, even to the point of outright economic sanctions if necessary, leveraging global partners to do the same. Overly reliant on Pakistan to defeat insurgent and terror strongholds in the lawless border regions, however, the United States was fearful to put too much pressure on the nation. Without Pakistan's full cooperation in the elimination of the Taliban, it could never achieve victory, as the Taliban and allied insurgents always had a safe haven where to recuperate and rearm in Pakistan. In 2003, the US invaded Iraq for reasons that continue to be questioned today. And let's be clear, the nation had no weapons of mass destruction. Whatever the reason, the sham directly led to the inevitable defeat in Afghanistan, as it split US forces between two insurgencies. The dual wars has also led to a loss of focus in both conflicts, inevitably leading to disaster in both wars. The thinning of manpower and resources, however, had perhaps the greatest effect as modern counterinsurgency doctrine states that friendly forces should outnumber insurgents 10 to 1 in order to establish a large enough security presence to make it difficult or impossible for insurgents to operate. In Afghanistan, at its height of US involvement, that ratio was 5 to 1. In order to achieve even that losing ratio, however, the United States blundered yet again. With the onset of the Iraq War, it was clear that the US did not have the manpower to secure both Iraq and Afghanistan against national insurgencies, and America was left with two choices. Either institute a national draft, which would be political suicide for any administration, or hire mercenaries. The United States opted for the latter, single-handedly resurrecting a career that had almost completely died out in the modern Westphalian order age.
Eventually, the US had as many mercenaries in Afghanistan as it did its own troops. And while mercenary use can be a very effective force multiplier, to the Afghan people it simply looked like even more foreign invaders were taking over the country. To make matters worse, most of the mercenaries quickly grew a bad reputation for treating the Afghanis with great disrespect, either through outright hostility or abuse or cultural insensitivity. The US had so many mercenary outfits working in the region that it quickly lost the ability to effectively police their behavior, seriously undermining its own hearts and minds efforts. And of course, this lack of cultural sensitivity spread to the US forces themselves, with many of them treating the local Afghan population as potential adversaries at all times. Simple things like not removing sunglasses to allow for eye contact, a sign of respect in Afghanistan, to US troops constantly conducting security patrols in heavy vehicles and fully armored only added to mistrust and dislike of the Americans as invaders. British forces eventually began to conduct dress-down patrols with soldiers in minimal equipment and the results were immediately favorable amongst the locals. Perhaps the greatest reason why the US failed in Afghanistan, however, is because of its failure to transition from military action to police action. Combating an insurgency is not a military action, but rather a long-term police action requiring specialized training and an enduring presence and investment, not just in physical security but political stability. The United States military may be the world's finest fighting force, but it, just like the mighty Red Army before it, is poorly suited for police actions. There is one simple reason why colonial powers were able to quash insurgencies in every nation they invaded and controlled. They didn't leave. Britain, Portugal, France, Germany, and other colonial powers faced insurgencies in nearly every territory they brutally exploited. But it was their permanent presence with superior firepower in those territories that led to the inevitable exhaustion of the insurgency. From the onset, the Taliban knew that the best way to beat the United States was to follow the example set by the Viet Cong. Make America bleed and simply wait it out. Eventually, political will and money will run out. To defeat the Taliban, the United States needed to have a long-term, semi-permanent presence in the nation. But keeping troops overseas on long and constant deployments is wildly unpopular. That's why, as noted by the National Defense University professor Sean McFaight, the United States needs to borrow a page from an ally's playbook. The French Foreign Legion is a branch of the French military that recruits from all over the world, offering salary and French citizenship in return. An American Foreign Legion would allow the US to project long-term forces without the inevitable public backlash caused by constant deployments of its troops from the homeland. In exchange, the American Foreign Legion would open a pathway to citizenship for many who may try to gain entry through illegal means. But that's not the only benefit. Long-term service in Afghanistan by the American Legion would also result in legionnaires that are well-steeped in Afghan culture and customs, as opposed to deployments of American troops who likely can't even find Afghanistan on a map. Or recognize the significant insult that holding a conversation with an Afghani while keeping your sunglasses on is. By learning, even adopting Afghan customs, American legionnaires would be more quickly winning battles for hearts and minds, but also even more effective in spotting and eliminating insurgent forces and their support networks. The ingratiation of American legionnaires into Afghan culture through long-term deployments lasting years would also help shift the perspective of the American security forces from invaders to locals, lessening the effectiveness of one of the Taliban's most powerful recruitment enticements. Even more importantly, however, the American Foreign Legion's permanent presence in the region would eliminate the brain drain that happens every time an experienced troop is replaced by a freshly deployed one. Without a permanent presence, America's defeat was inevitable. We don't need a space force, we need an American Foreign Legion, which would have benefits in conflicts around the globe. In the end, the United States moved from blunder to blunder in its 20 years in Afghanistan, often ignoring the advice of locals, such as a call to establish the still popular King Mohammed Zahir Shah as ruler after the invasion, which could have provided some level of national unity. Instead, the US chose to prop up a series of corrupt presidents, only making the national government even more unpopular with the people and engendering support for the Taliban's return. The wildly unpoliced influx of aid grants from the US only served to further drive political corruption and undermine the US's efforts to create a stable national government. The seeds of America's defeat were planted in 1979. With its lack of accountability for the hundreds of millions of military aid provided to the Mujahideen, however, the entire 20-year war could have been completely avoided in the first place 
if the U.S. has simply listened to the Taliban's own enemies, who warned that the group was in danger of imminent collapse. Instead, the U.S. invasion led to the Taliban joining ranks in opposition to foreign invaders. Even once committed to its military action, though, America continued to fight in ways that only undermined its own goals, while all the time failing to identify and pursue strategic rather than simply tactical goals. While today many look to pin the blame, the truth is there is no one figure that can bear that blame. President Donald Trump is not to blame for negotiating the exit of U.S. troops with the Taliban any more than President Joe Biden is to blame for sticking to that negotiated deal. Both were simply carrying out the inevitable defeat of U.S. goals in the nation due to 20 years of complete mismanagement. Now go check out Surviving Actual Military Combat, a true story from one of our staff writers, or click this other video instead.